the last one that was written. It's also one of the most engaging cover-to-cover narratives in all of Scripture. And uh, I'm going to break it down into like 10 episodes for you. It's a wonderful story. Uh, and I know some of you are overachievers, and so you're probably, if you haven't read it before, you're probably going to go home and read through the whole book of Esther. And if that's the case, great. Go ahead and do that. Um, just don't spoil it for those that kind of want to walk through it uh, piece by piece. I uh, also know some of you are probably like me in high school when they had a book report. I would go and try to find the movie of the, the book instead of reading the book. Um, and so if you're that kind of person and you want to know the story, uh, you're going to wind up in probably one of two locations. One is Veggie Tales, and the other is the movie 300. Um, now, Veggie Tales uh, has Xerxes as the king of the world played by a plump cucumber, okay? So just be aware of that. The king of the world is a plump cucumber, so not exactly historically accurate. And then the movie 300, of course, is rated R. It's violent, um, and they took some liberties with the historical content as well. Uh, if you're a gamer, you could actually go and play through some of this story uh, in the Assassin's Creed Odyssey game. Um, however, again, that's a rated M for mature game, and it also uh, takes some historical liberties. And so I would just encourage you to walk through it together as a church family. Uh, Ten episodes coming up, uh, starting today with a little bit of an uh, introduction. Now, Israel, at the time that this was written, was, well, they were living it up, okay? So in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 18, we read this prophecy. It says, Today I am the one who made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and its population. So at this point, Israel was obeying God, and God had promised to put this fortified city around them, and that promise came true. Uh, they were a very wealthy city. Uh, they actually were in two different cities, Judah and, Israel, and uh, Jerusalem. And so they were kind of split into two different places, but they were still very strong among the nations of the world. And because of that, they had a lot of money. And when you have a lot of money, uh, a lot of times you don't think you need God. And so as is human nature, they decided that they didn't really need God anymore because they had all this money and wealth and power and prosperity, um, which, by the way, is the essence of sin when you think that you don't need God anymore. Um, and so they began to sin. And then we read in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 34, another prophecy. This was written before all these things happened. It says, you know, you're going to start out good, and then eventually uh, you're going to fall off the map. It says, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has set me aside like an empty dish. He has swallowed me like a sea monster. And so because of the people's sin, God wanted to get his people's attention, kind of the way that you do when you put your kid in time out to get their attention, to help them see, hey, you're, you're not doing right, you need to kind of change some things. Well, God did this to his people. He put them in time out, and he handed them over to the great dragon, the king Nebuchadnezzar. Israel spent 70 years exiled in Babylon, which was 900 miles from their hometown, and then Jerusalem was also laid to waste during that time period. And so some people began to doubt God's love. Naturally, when things go bad, we were like, well, God, you must not love us anymore. So God gave them another prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 3. It says, go and proclaim these words to the north and say, return, unfaithful Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. I will not look on you with anger, for I am unfailing in my love. This is the Lord's declaration. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against the Lord your God. You have scattered your favors to strangers under every green tree and have not obeyed me. This is the Lord's declaration. And so this happened. People in captivity realized that they were there because of their own sin, and they began to repent and turn back toward God. And so God sent the great lion, King Cyrus, to defeat the great dragon, which was King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Cyrus, when he took the throne, he issued the first bill of rights in all of human history. He told Jerusalem, uh, Israel that they could go back to their hometown of Jerusalem and start to rebuild their city. And so if you want to read that, um, those stories, you can go to the book of Haggai, which talks about how the Jews returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. You can read the book of Ezra, which talks about how the Jews went back to Jerusalem to rebuild society. You can read the book of Nehemiah, which talks about how the Jews went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. But most of the Jews disobeyed God and did not return home. So there's this other interesting prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. It says, Three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth will be far richer than the others. 
By the power he gains through his riches, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. So this fourth king was King Xerxes. Uh, he was bigger than the dragon, he was bigger than the lion, and he was, in fact, nicknamed the king of the world. Now, shortly before Xerxes took his throne, there was a family from the tribe of Benjamin who had neglected to go back to J Jerusalem like God had commanded them, and they instead decided to go to the richest city on earth, which was the city at that point uh, of Susa, which was actually King Xerxes' hometown as well. And on their way to Susa, the mother and the father, they died, and they left behind a, a little girl, and she was raised by her cousin Mordecai in Susa. And this child would grow up to be one of the greatest servants of God the world had ever seen. Her name was Esther, and we are going to start her story today. So thank you uh, for putting up with a little bit of historical background context. I just want you to understand this is not some fictional tale. This is a historical event that actually happened. And if you study this book of the Bible, it will absolutely change your life. So let's look at verse 1. We're just going to do the first nine verses today, knock out the intro, and then we'll get really rolling next week. But this week, I want you to, to look at verse 1 of Esther chapter 1. It says, these events took place during the days of Ahasuerus, who ruled 127 provinces from India to Cush. Ahasuerus is the um, Hebrew name of Xerxes. Uh, I have a lot more trouble saying Ahasuerus um, because I'm from West Virginia and I didn't learn how to talk. Um, so I'm going to stick with Xerxes, if you don't mind. We're going to stay with the Greek. I'm going to call him Xerxes because um, it's just a little bit easier for this West Virginia boy to say. Um, Xerxes, to put it very simply, was a spoiled brat. Now, look, I'm an only child. I know spoiled brats when I see them, and even this dude embarrasses me. Like, for example, on his 16th birthday, his father Darius gave him a three million square mile kingdom. <laughs> Happy birthday. Here's, uh, here's Pakistan. Here's Ethiopia. Here's the Sudan. Happy sweet 16, buddy. You're in charge of all these things. And Xerxes, upon receiving this gift, this is a quote from Xerxes himself, he humbly said these words, I am Xerxes, the great king, the only king, the king of all countries, which speak all kinds of languages, the king of this entire far-reaching earth. What a humble guy, right? 16 years old, three million square mile kingdom, spoiled rotten. Verse two, in those days, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne, throne in the fortress at Susa. So another thing you need to know about Xerxes, he used his his fortress to abuse people. Susa was a place where people were abused. He had a, a harem of women who were emotionally and physically abused for his enjoyment. Uh, he actually started the first postal system, but he did so in order to distribute his decrees across this massive kingdom that he just inherited. And their motto was, see if this sounds familiar, neither snow, rain, nor gloom of night stays valiant couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. That's not the U.S. Postal Service. They actually got that from Xerxes, who created the first postal system. So you might think, well, great, he did that just to be nice to people. No, he didn't. Uh, he did that so he could distribute his decrees across all of his kingdom. And if you broke any of the king's decrees, you were instantly killed. No matter what, you were instantly killed, punishable by death. It also says that Xerxes reigned from his throne. And when he was on this throne, he felt like a god. He built this throne 72 feet above anything else in the city, and he loved his throne so much that if you walked near the throne and did not bow down to the throne, you were instantly killed. He would have men carry his throne into battle, and these men were his staff, known as the Immortals. 2,000 horsemen, 2,000 lancers, and 10,000 infantrymen would surround this throne in battle as Xerxes watched. In verse 3, it says, He held a feast in the third year of his reign for all of his officials and staff, the army of Persia and Media, and the nobles and the officials from all the provinces. So what does he do with all of this power? Well, of course, he throws a giant party. He throws a party for all the influencers in the kingdom to buy their love. And at the party, he gives them food and drinks and gifts, and they're all given uh, wives from his harem. And it's just a, an incredible party that lasted, in verse 4, it tells us, for 180 days. That's a long party. That's a six-month rager, okay? These guys partied for six months. And then it says in verse 5, at the end of that time, the king held another party 
a week-long banquet in the garden of the courtyard of the royal palace for all of the people, from the greatest to the least, who were present in the fortress of Susa. So then he invites all the normals, all the common people, to come to his house, to his temple, and they're able to party. He, he's using this as a flex to show these people that he is in charge, that he is powerful. He's using this as a way to control them. And of course, all the normal people, they got excited. Wow, they get a, a week off work, and they get to go to a party, and they get to get some face time with the, the king and a tour of his palace. Then in verse 6, it says, White and blue linen hangings were fastened in fine white and purple linen cords to silver rods on marble columns. Gold and silver couches. Gold and silver couches. <laughs> Anybody got a gold or silver couch in your house? Gold and silver couches, that can't be comfortable, were arranged on a mosaic pavement of red feldspar, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in an array of gold goblets, each one with a different design. Royal wine flowed freely according to the king's bounty. The drinking was according to royal decree. There are no restrictions. The king had ordered every wine steward in his household to serve whatever each person wanted. These gold goblets, by the way, were worth more than the average person would make in their entire lifetime. And they were given out as a door prize to anybody that came to the party. Open bar, gold couches, paid vacation, all to celebrate that Xerxes was the king of the world. But honestly, it was done so that he could control and abuse people for his pleasure. So then in verse 9, we read about Queen Vashti. She also gave a feast, but this feast was for the women of King Xerxes' palace. <laughs> Imagine that. Women wanted nothing to do with a party where men had been drinking at an open bar for six straight months. Huh. So they have their own party uh, off to the side to stay away from the men. Now, lest we forget that Xerxes is an absolute monster, Queen Vashti was actually Xerxes' sister-in-law who he forcibly stole from his brother. Xerxes was also married to a niece by that same brother. So the queen went against his preferences, and that foreshadows some trouble to come, but we'll get into that uh, next week. I just wanted to kind of paint a little bit of a picture about what King Xerxes was all about. So other than Esther, who is missing in this story so far? Yeah, there's Mordecai and all them, right? So think, think more at a divine level. No mention of God, right? We just went through the whole introduction of the book, and there's no mention of God. And as a matter of fact, if you read through the entire book of Esther, you will not find one mention of God. And so you might say, well, well PK, why is this book in my Bible if it doesn't even talk about God? Well, that's exactly why God put this book on my heart to begin 2022. Because the people in the story are asking, where is God? And I feel like there are a lot of people in our society today, in our community, that are asking that same question. Where is God? The rich are getting richer. The poor are getting poorer. The government is getting more oppressive. You might say, well, God, do, do you exist? Uh, this is your world and your creation, but crazy people have seemed to have taken over. Are you paying attention? Do you even care about me anymore? Women are being abused by the millions Money is being wasted while people are dying of preventable diseases. Influencers are using all forms of media to flex and control people. And so the question is, God, where are you? Now, here's the cool thing about this book. The absence of God absolutely reveals the presence of God. As you read through here, what you'll notice is the absence of God reveals the presence of God. You see, God never restricts human free will. Even when we choose to sin, even when those decisions have major negative consequences, God does not step in and stop human free will. But God is sovereign over all of the decisions that we make. God is in the background orchestrating history to accomplish his good will and purpose. God is working all things for his glory and for those who place their faith in him. And so in this story, Xerxes represents an evil king from an evil kingdom. He's the king of the world. 
He's the king of the same world that we live in today, a world that is challenging and violent and oftentimes evil. And the world, that, it's a world that has captured so many of us and taken so many of us hostage, tempting us toward financial gain at the expense of relationships, tempting us toward pleasure at the expense of worship, tempting us toward comfort at the expense of service to others, tempting us into addictive decisions. This world tempts us with a, a tour of its kingdom, with the gold goblets and the, the silver couches and all these promises of a better life. But at the end of the day, all it's doing is trapping us so it can abuse us every step of the way. This true story is in your Bible to show you that the real king of the world is not like that. So just right, tell your neighbor, tell them the history lesson's over now. And we're going to get into some really good stuff. So kind of poke them, wake them up, say, look, history lesson's over. We're going to talk about some really cool stuff. So Lynn, what I need for you to do is channel your, your inner Southern Baptist worship leader, okay? Like old school style. And I'm going to say something, and I want you to give me one of those cool little organ things, right? Because there's a couple people that are asleep right now. We need to wake them up. All right. So I'm going to, here we go. Xerxes knew only riches and royalty, but Jesus knew only poverty and humility. Oh, boy. Uh-oh. <laughs> that woke him up. That woke him up. That's, that's your roots coming out of there. Look, Xerxes knew only riches and royalty. He could not relate to anybody. But Jesus, even though he was God, came to earth and knew only humility and poverty so that he could relate to you. We do not have a high priest that has not walked the, the walk that you have walked, who has not suffered the things that you have suffered, who was not tempted the way that you were tempted. We have a high priest who came to earth and was tempted in every single way that we are, yet handled it without sin. That high priest can relate to you because he lived your life. Xerxes thought he ruled from heavens and earth. Jesus made the heavens and earth. One more time. This one. Come on. <laughs> that was it. That's all we got for today, folks. I'm sorry. We blew up the organ. <laughs> no, you can get my next one. You can get my next one. Xerxes thought he ruled the heavens and earth. Jesus made the heavens and earth. Xerxes used his power to abuse women, but Jesus uses his power to honor women. That's right. You got to get that one, right? He used his power to honor women. It, 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 this was a time, I don't, maybe this doesn't land the way it would if it was like 2,000 years ago when Jesus was on earth, but when Jesus decided to call women as his disciples, to teach them, to allow them to participate in ministry, to put them out at the forefront of the early church, that was radical, rebellious behavior, because at this time, women were not treated much better than livestock, and Jesus came along and gave them the honor and the dignity that they deserved. So we got this guy, Xerxes, who represents a, a cruel world that's oppressive to women, and then you have this hero, King Jesus, who comes and lifts women up and honors them. Xerxes was a man who thought he was God, but Jesus is God. The Bible tells us that Jesus existed in the form of God, 100% God, 100% man. Xerxes could sit on his throne and pretend he was God, but Jesus really was God. Xerxes reigned from an earthly throne, but Jesus stepped off his heavenly throne and came to earth to dwell with us, to love us and serve us and save us. Xerxes destroyed his enemies, but Jesus died for his enemies. Remember what he said on the cross? Like he's hanging from a cross with nails piercing his hands and his feet, with Roman soldiers casting disparaging comments toward him, with people spitting at him, with a crown of thorns that had been placed on his head, with a, a sign over him that said, here is the king of the Jews, mockingly and hanging him in front of all of these people. And Jesus looks out and he's not angry. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Xerxes killed people for not bowing at his throne, but Jesus loved people enough that even when they were killing him on a cross, he forgave his enemies. Xerxes surrounded himself by thousands of guards. Jesus surrounds himself by, himself by thousands of angels. You see the contrast here. This is how you read the book of Esther. God is not present, but he's present. It's a, it's a story of contrasts. 
Xerxes, the king of the world, the evil king. Jesus, the king of the world, the good king. Xerxes spent his entire life having others serve him, but Jesus spent his entire life serving others. It says in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Xerxes bought love. Jesus is love. That's important because some of you think that you have to earn Jesus' love, that you have to to dance for him and perform for him and live up to his expectations in order to receive his love. Some people think they have to clean themselves from all of their sin before they can have a relationship with Jesus, but that's not the case. Jesus loves you at your worst, and he gave his life for you while you were yet a sinner. Xerxes thought he controlled everything under the sun. Jesus controls everything, and by the way, Jesus made the sun. Xerxes wasted his resources on helping others. Jesus invests his resources on, and it, let me try that one again. Xerxes wasted his resources on helping himself. Jesus shares his resources in helping others. Xerxes, thank you, Xerxes drank wine to party with humanity, but Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath to free humanity from sin. Jesus said, I'll lay down my life willingly for you. I drink the cup of God's wrath towards sin for you. I give my life for you so that you can be saved and have an eternal relationship with the Heavenly Father. Xerxes thought he was the king of the world, but friends, Jesus is the king of the world. And what you have to decide this morning is you have to decide which king you want to serve. Now, some of you have been tricked into thinking that the world is better than Jesus. The world has tempted you with some things, and you think these things are going to be better than your relationship with Jesus. And I just want to warn you, you're falling into a trap. Just like Xerxes laid out a trap for all of his followers, the world is laying out a trap for you. It wants you to give your life to the world so the world can abuse you at every opportunity. But there's this better king. His name is King Jesus. He came to love you and serve you and give his life for you. And if you give your life to him, he will not let you down. He will not abuse you at every opportunity because he is the good king. Father God, we are so blessed to be in your presence today. Thank you for allowing us to gather here. and Thank you for this book of the Bible. It's, a, it's such an interesting story. It's a true story, but it's just so strange to not see your name high and lifted up in the pages of this book. But Lord, as we study it and work through it, we do see that you are there. Lord, you are orchestrating history for the betterment of your people. And right now, for the, for the Jews, and especially for Esther and Queen Vashti and all these others, Lord, it just seems like the, the world is so big and scary and oppressive, and there's this man that's in charge, and he's the king, but he's this evil king in an evil kingdom, and people are being abused, and Lord, it just seems so hopeless, but as we continue to read and study, we learn that the real king is still on the throne. Lord, that you are there, that you are present, And while people do make decisions in their free will that hurt other people, you are still sovereign over those decisions and you are still in control. And it's just so cool to see how you work out history the way that you did in order to accomplish your good purpose and to take care of your people. So today, Lord, we just want to celebrate that. We want to thank you that even in 2022, Lord, when things look a little bit crazy and the the world's kind of spinning off its axis, it seems, that you are still here and you are still in control. And Even when we don't see you, you are there. And so, Lord, for those that are just overwhelmed this morning, I pray that they will find comfort knowing that even in the dark times and the crazy times, that you are still in control, that you still love them and that you still gave your life for them and that you want a relationship with them. And I pray that they would today just bow down at the feet of King Jesus and allow him to be their Lord and Savior, allow him to dictate and control their life and lead them into the green pastures lead them to the still waters. And Lord, as your church, we, we also know as we look outside the walls of this church, there are so many people in our community that they just, they're, they're looking for hope and peace and love and joy and comfort. And 
and, and blessing in all the wrong places. And Lord, we have access to the truth. And so I pray that you will loosen our tongues and allow us to speak the truth and love to the world that so desperately needs to hear about King Jesus. So as we close this service today with a, a communion time, celebrating what you did for us on the cross, I, I pray, Lord, that you would just draw us near to you, that you would inspire us to love you more and to share your love with others. And Lord, if there's anything that's causing a, a, a roadblock between us and, and you, I, I pray that you would help us to identify that and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would remove that, whether it be unforgiveness, addiction, guilt, shame, whatever it is that's putting that distance between us, Lord, we know that you're able to close the gap. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would close that gap for us today. Thank you, King Jesus, for all that you've done for me and all you've done for this church. It's in your name we pray. Amen. you keep standing at a distance in the shadow of your shame there's a light of hope that shining won't you come and take your place
your sorrow and your sadness there's a savior and he calls bring it all to the table